back to the Traction Reaction Podcast. Steve Zotke here. Got a special guest. We're going to be talking with Sonny Bell Kane. And he's a guy that's been around the block a few times. When you think of Southern California hot rodding, uh, Sonny is one of the legends that have pretty much have, you know, he's pretty much done everything. He's come out with a book. And this thing's pretty neat. Raul Sonny Bell Kane. And uh, basically he talks about his life in, in racing. And Sonny, you come from a time where kind of had to know a little bit about a little bit about everything didn't you it didn't matter if it was uh road racing dirt track racing you kind of dabbled in everything didn't it including drag that's racing correct. that that here in southern california was a seedbed of motor racing in those days as i said in the book all of the great harry miller started here with the miller car and then then myron drake ended up with the engine business uh, which was you know part of the offenhauser which was used in the speedway cars and the sprinters and so forth and then we had the infant sport of drag racing which i was a pioneer in top fuel and there's pictures of the car in the book but it's in the beginning days of all this and we and then we started into the little area of sport cars which was really kind of a gentleman's sport and that sort of moved into professionalism after shelby got involved with it because he got ford motor company sponsorship but uh what i was trying to explain in my book here steve is that it something for a younger person this has been two generations since me mm -hmm. to show that how all this nucleus started right here in los angeles and moved across the country which my friend bob peterson was a lot responsible for with hot ride magazine and his other magazines but anyway we give what you might have some other questions so that's my general synopsis. well it certainly does and and you know, i always say you know people go why are you involved in auto racing and it it's certainly the love of the sport but it's also the people too uh, it's the people that make me want to, you know, go down and see again, once again, in Indianapolis in a couple of weeks. And, and it, it, you certainly met a few people that kind of caught my eye. Uh, of course, the, probably one of the most famous ones is, uh, Lance Reventlow and the Scarab Project. Uh, can kind of walk us how that came out, came about. Well, Lance. You know, it, it, ironically, Lance was a gentleman racer. He, he, we had, we maintained his sports cars for him. He had a Maserati two liter, and then he also had a 1100 CC Cooper, which was a rear engine car we maintained at Warren Olson shop, which, which we ultimately built the Scarabs. And Lance, you know, was Barbara Hutton's son, as you read, who was the Woolworth heiress. And so he had really in that day, which was the fifties, uh, later fifties, really an unlimited amount of wealth although there was some restraints. And he, we created a company called Revenlo Automobiles Incorporated and built the Scarabs. And out of that came the sports cars, which we won all the races in North America. We literally dominated things. And uh, we used a modified Chevrolet V8, which was just was coming on the scene in those days. So it was a perfect motor for we hot rodders to, to heat up, as we say. And uh, Lance was a very special person. He was very motivated. Bruce Kessler, of course, was his good friend. And that's how it all came about. So, uh, I mean, he's my age. My contemporary would have been he'd been alive. Unfortunately, he died young, as you know, from the plane crash. So, and, and walk us around uh, the the Formula One project. You know, it, it's incredible time. It was, of course, it was a transitional time. You know, they say in in, in pretty much anything, timing is so important. Walk us through a little bit because uh, I, I I'm really interested in in the power plant. Well, what it, it doesn't have an Offy in it. It has a uniquely designed engine that was designed by Leo Goosen, who also designed the Offenhauser. And we Lance wanted to build his own unique American engine. And so we started out with a clean sheet of paper, and Leo designed a whole new engine. And at the time, the hottest valve gear in town was the one that Mercedes-Benz had used in the 300 SLR and the W196. And so the Travers and Coons had been working for Howard Keck the, the Indi, for the Indy team, because Bill Vukovic was his driver, their driver, I should say. And after Vuki was killed, they Howard quit racing, and the Travers and Coons, as we call the rich kids, were back in Detroit, and they were able to dismantle a 300 SL that was about, I mean, 300 SLR that was in the Henry Ford Museum, and they blueprinted the valve gear which was desmodromic, and that meant all mechanical, no valve springs. So mm -hmm. they brought all those drawings back with them, and they had them in-house. So Lance said, this is what we need to do. We need to build this unique engine and put this unique new valve gear in here, which is going to give us unlimited RPM. Although we know as engineers that RPM doesn't come from just valve gear. But, mm -hmm. you know, we tried, we tried our best, and, and uh, we built an engine from scratch. And uh, I have my, you know, my own engineering background. 
Brown. I just thought that there was a lot, lot of things that could have been different. But, you know, there were other people older than wiser, supposedly wiser than me at the time. I'm not being arrogant here. <laughs> that had better ideas, but I'm a drag racer and a hot rodder. And, and uh, I said so in the book about building the engine. And it was a, it was an exorbitant time. And we actually went to Europe with those three race cars ready to set the world on fire. But we were the last of really the front engine cars, right? We were eating at a 2.5 liter normally aspirated engine. Now, now of course, everything's changed over there. And, uh, you know, in, in our midst, ironically, as I said in the book, we were the Cooper distributors, which was a little rear engine car from England. And we, if we had our hindsight, we would have obviously built the rear engine car, which was later, which later happened with Scarab. Right. But by then it was a little too late, but using an American engine that we used a, a Buick. What, what, one of the most underrated, uh, personalities in, in racing uh, and someone that my dad met and actually ran at Milwaukee a few times was Chuck Day. Uh, just oh, great. A guy. First, really good uh, friend of mine. Sorry. Yeah, please t t t tell us about Chuck and, and kind of his background in that. Well, he was a real, you know, was a real racer. I mean, he came from Ford Motor Company and he worked with Holman and Moody and he drove the Thunderbirds to Daytona and all those things. And he grew up in the Long Beach set and that would had to do with Bill Strop. And he he was just a swashbuckling all round racer. You know, he was a great driver. So, you know, he used to go out and test this carob. And then all of a sudden, everybody said, Jesus, this guy's making really quick time. And then he ended up driving the car, and of course, became the, the, the real number one guru for driving the scarab sport cars. And he did drive the Formula One car in Europe, too. And he did his level best, believe me. He, he was a mechanic by nature, which gives us, if I can be arrogant, sort of a sensitivity to the machinery. And that makes a big difference. He did his best with that. So, yeah, I mean, the Day brothers themselves, including Harold, were a unique combination. And yeah, he he was actually a, a set the track record for stock cars at Milwaukee, too, under his right. under an assumed <laughs> name. I think it was Char Charlie George or something was his name that he uh -huh. used. And, uh, yeah, he was a fascinating driver. Actually drove a little bit for the leader car team that was uh, based out of Milwaukee. And, and just, a, a, just a neat guy. Just... Uh, he, 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 but yeah, I got to tell you another little story. I, through my connections, because I was everywhere in motor racing those in those years, a friend of mine, Frank McGurk, was a J.C. Agajanian's Indy mechanic, and he had J.C.'s car that he was going to run at the Speedway. So I talked McGurk into giving Charlie a test ride in the car. So uh, they took him back to the Speedway, and, you know, Aggie was looking for a driver at the time, and uh, Chuck got in the car, and he did his level best, and, of course, it was a pretty it were bricks down the main straightaway and they were pretty rugged. Anyway, he said when he went in, those old roasters weren't the best ride in town. And he goes steaming down the speedway and he said, can't think. He said, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I said, why, Chuck? He says, that wall kept coming up and I got frightened. Yeah. He says, I, just, I lost my my mojo, so to speak, because of the wall, which yeah, we I'm know drivers always dread as it is. <laughs> this, this is certainly true. Uh, uh, you, you brought up one fella, and uh, he's, he, he's interesting, and it's one of these what-if situations, and, and that's Bruce Kessler. What, tell us a bit about him for those who may not be familiar with him. Well, you know, he's still a personal friend of mine. We're both the same age, and he, of course, became a very famous film uh, director, and I don't know how many TV shows and movies he's got to his credit, including helping Frankenheimer as second cam, uh, second second director on the uh, you know the Grand Prix series that Frank that, that Frankenheimer made back in the sixties, but he he's uh, he came from a uh, relatively well off family here in Beverly Hills, and he raced his mother's XK one twenty Jaguar, and one thing led to another, and he and Lance went to private school together in Arizona. Lance's mother had farmed him out, and he'd been in private school in Arizona. And Bruce met him there and they became instant friends. And he really is the nucleus of how the Scarab really came about because he took Lance to England and they met Brian Lister. There's a story in my book about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they they went ahead and, and Lance comes out of there and he said, you know what? I'm going to build my own bloody car. And they come back to the U.S. and that's the start of the Scarab. But if it weren't for Bruce, none of that would have happened. Um, I mean, one would assume, but you know. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, another interesting story that I saw that caught my eye was who puts a 270 cubic inch Offenhauser into a slingshot dragster? <laughs> I don't know who that was. I don't know who that was. But, you know, my buddy, oh, mine? Oh, no, that, yes. that, 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 that wasn't a 270. 
that was a 320 offie. That was a really biggie offie. Okay. And had my great guru, Ed Donovan, from drag racing, the, yep. the, the first big uh, aluminum Emmys for the drags. He's the one that did that. And that thing used to set the tires on fire all the way down the track, as I said in my book. I and we had a 671 it. blower and a 320 cubic inch four cylinder. But Donovan loved four cylinders. Mm-hmm. And he wanted it set the, and I believe that probably was the fastest four cylinder ever in the drags. Sure. Because we ran in the beginning, our original dragster, his dragster, of which I was lucky to be a part of, what had an old Fargo four port head on it. And it's a farm looking implement that you'll see pictures of in my book. And it was full of nitromethane. And that thing used to go 120 miles an hour <laughs> back in back in 54, 55. So that was a long time ago. This really caught my eye. And I, 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 so one, actually, one of my favorite chapters is you got involved with enology. And it became a, it was a, a Chevalier du uh, Testavant. Uh, en français, Chevalier <laughs> du Testavant. Oui, oui. And I enjoyed it because I, anything I, I like to apply myself to something, and I was always interested in it. As I said in the book, because of my family and the University of Davis here, which is our big enological area up in Northern California. And uh, it just, it's an exciting thing. There were a lot of individuals in it that really were movers and shakers. And I felt I fit the bill and I became a great member of it. When you get into anything, whether it's cigars, wine, anything, uh, cooking, uh, anybody who's like at the top of their game, I always find it interesting because they make it interesting. They, they can tell you things that the normal person off the street might not understand. I always find that if, if interesting. You you mentioned some stuff with winery. You know, I, I love a good glass of wine as, as much as anybody. I don't have the refined palate, but I can get to the point where you, you know good wine from from bad wine. At least I, right, I right. think I can. And just walk us through how, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, you even traded a case of wine for a Harley Davidson, too. Uh, for my wine. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it was a valuable wine I bought at the time. And I said I had bought it on what we call a future, which is mm-hmm. you could put in your order and you get it placed and it comes in on future which is the way the Bordelais in in uh, France uh, get collect money ahead of time so they know they've got a guaranteed sale well that of course has changed now because wine has become such a significant collection and it's become very valuable I mean I have one bottle in my collection as an example right now in 1961 Chevette Blanc which is a Bordeaux that's worth seven thousand five hundred dollars well that's too expensive for me to drink with my friends or even take a risk of pulling the cork sure <laughs> put it up for auction but you know it's it's a hobby like motorsports it's just and a lot of more motorsports racers did like wine Mm -hmm. and and so and and we raced in europe with the with the formula cars and things like that so it's just a a different way of doing it my friend phil hill is an example love bordeaux Mm -hmm. So on. It's just a, another hobby and another way you can express yourself in learning something new. And uh, I've always been curious, and that helped me to, to move forward. I was going to say to you, if you want to learn about wine, just drink it and think in your mind about the way it looks, the way it, mm-hmm. the bouquet smells, the way it tastes, and the way it tastes with certain foods. And, uh, you know, you can begin to learn and read a little bit about it, you know. But a lot of today, I think there's a lot of glitz in the communication with the particular journalists that write about wine they give it really oh that tastes like chocolate this is like oranges and this has got some peaches and apricot i mean all this stuff i mean you've got to like what you drink and that's it and yeah i'll just point out one other thing i've always said about wine people used to ask me what's your favorite wine and i said whatever yours is mm-hmm. <laughs> because that's the point. you know it makes a point that's whatever it is. everybody's different food and wine is a very exciting pastime hobby so to speak and i think it adds a lot to it i of course was in the wine business for a while using my knowledge to buy and sell wine and so on but i think it it's an exciting for career for somebody to get into if they, they want to it's sure. it, it's how do we say it it's very esoteric just like motor racing yep very much and it's one of those things you don't know where uh it's going to take you and same thing with auto race with me i've gotten into some corners of auto racing i never thought i would you know we would get into and it's just a situation where there's opportunities and there's twists and turns uh and you never know where it's going to take you and as you you certainly have done that with uh with a variety of, of people you've been involved with and uh, uh areas of auto racing just fascinating well i thank you you know I, I i knew everybody in motor racing in the day and of course a lot of us have gone on to do really great things 
And, you know, one ex- exception, I mean, like Phil Hill and, and Dan Gurney and, and a lot of other people, you know, which I mentioned in the book briefly. But I think what I was trying to communicate here, if I may say so, is I was trying to span two generations that I've seen that have evolved up through the ranks and I want to or, or want to and I want to talk to them about another time where all this nucleus came together and with smart people trying to move the sport forward and both the sport of drag racing, of course, and even stock car racing and and the speedway. Look how much Roger Penske has changed that sport through the years, as an example. And, uh, you know, my friend was Dale Drake, who was the son of, of I mean, John Drake, who was a friend of Dale, a son of Dale's mm-hmm. over at Mark Drake. And, you know, they built the office as long as they could. You know, they put blowers on it and everything else. But sooner or later, it's time had come, you know. Yeah. Cost came in and changed things. But, you know, I'm, it, it's just, in our day, what we look for more than the overall car is making the engines put out more power. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what it was all about. And then the handling kind of almost came secondary, although it was important. Sure. But we, we've got the power. We figured we could go down the straightaway and blitz them. And then we wanted to go into the corners, you know, quicker. So we need better brakes. And of course we had drum brakes. We didn't even have discs until later. You know, all that stuff has come about, you know, I mean, so I, I, I was at a dinner about two months ago and a friend of mine said, who built your engines? And I looked back at him and I said, built our engines? I said, we built our own bloody engines. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you used an order them online and they came in a crate? <laughs> yeah, but that's how they do it. I mean, my buddy Ed right. Pink has done very well and Ed's 92 years old building sure. races. <laughs> so it, the sports changed a lot. I watched Formula One. You know, I like I liked that Drive to Survive series. I think there's, I saw the race in Miami. I, you probably, you might've watched it too. Yep. One of the things that kind of bothered me, though, is they said, you know, the greatest spectacle of racing. Well, you and I both know that that was Indy's theme forever. How how this guy could come up with saying that in Miami with Formula One. Right. Formula One is the epitome, but at the same time, it's not the greatest spectacle in racing. Yep. You know, that that's the speedway, as we all know, being Americans. And I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying it seems like the man didn't have span the history to understand really what had gone on. Exactly. But I think that, you know, Formula One's really come on strong. But when I see all these drivers becoming massive celebrities, Jesus, they're, they're mm-hmm. posing for clothing and jackets and every other damn thing. You know, they're, 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 I would hope that they want to race. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, as your friend Chuck Pelly said, this uh, this book does really want, uh, want you to get into that time machine. Highly recommend it. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, my friend Paul Zimmerman has it as as at uh his store at the motorsportcollector.com and uh sonny we certainly appreciate uh eight you uh, taking time out well i i re- appreciate the interview and i hope people pick up the book because i think they'll find it an enjoyable read all right thank you sonny you've been okay, listening you. you've been thank listening you. to the traction reaction podcast i'm steve zotke don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast <laughs>